Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during these presentations today, please type them into the questions section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of each presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Laurie. I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, July 6th edition of Crop Talk. Today we have uh, something a little bit different going on. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking into or uh, getting a visit from our crop diversification centers across the province. I thought it would be a good idea to uh, to bring uh, bring them on and for them to give us a, a brief update as to what they're doing in their areas or of the province, uh, what they're doing for projects, what they're doing for research, and also for them to discuss uh, about their annual field days coming up because I think it'd be a great opportunity to visit these centers and uh, get a look at what's happening. Uh, they're uh, great areas to see in field trials, uh, trials that are, uh, whether they be right, right from scratch research to uh, actually showing research at the field scale level. And uh, so uh, it's a good opportunity to see what's happening and, uh, and again, a good update as to what, uh, what's going to be happening at their annual field days. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Scott Chalmers. Uh, he's going to start off today and then we're going to flow through all the, the different centers and uh, as I mentioned, we're going through all four of them, so it's probably going to take a fair bit of the time, so uh, we'll go from there. So uh, thanks for being on, guys, and take it away, Scott. Great. Thanks, Lionel. Can you hear me? You bet. All right. Yes, uh, my name is Scott Chalmers. I'm a diversification specialist, or I guess we call we call ourselves applied research specialist now <clears throat> with Manitoba Agriculture, and I, uh, I manage the... Uh, WADO or the Westman Agricultural Diversification Organization project and uh, I'll be talking about uh, our plans here in 2022. This morning we had two tents of rain in Reston but there's nothing down here in uh, Melita or, or Pearson so uh, um, it's a little more drier I guess today but uh, it sure looks wet around here. <clears throat> so as I said I'm part of the diversification centers uh, there's uh, three other sites, uh, I call them my sister sites, and uh, they'll be talking as well today. And uh, one from Carberry, Arburg, and Roblin, and I'm down here in Melita beside the big banana. I should also mention um, that we're, our funding comes uh, from the, the province uh, through the Agriculture Sustainability Initiative, as well as the Federal Bilateral Partnership uh, CAP which is the Canadian Agricultural Partnership. And uh, here's just the map of where we all are. Uh, we're scattered across the province and that gives us a diversity of different growing zones and, and climate conditions. And uh, of course, a bit of insurance. So if one site gets hailed out, we still have three others. Uh, this is my crew from last year. Uh, we just haven't taken our team photo yet. Uh, we just got everybody revved up now with hiring and. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a summer summer student now, and two casual students, uh, and uh, of course our uh, core uh, employees as well. So uh, eventually we'll get a new photo up here, but uh, I thought I'd put up last year's. So what is it that we do at the crop diversification centers? Well, we do applied crop research and extension, and so that if you can imagine all those small plots, as you can see in the background, um, we do it all with different crops. Uh, I think at one time I counted all the crops and we're up to about 80 crops, uh, 80 different crops of different sorts. And uh, uh, year to year, generally we have about 24 crops growing that are all different. And these are our diversified crops. And we also have, of course, uh, wheat and canola as well. Uh, so we look at maybe cropping systems or rotations, uh, maybe some pilot scale uh, stuff. Uh, we've done that with uh, flax fiber and buckwheat before. Uh, we have tons of variety trials and uh, a lot of those uh, variety trials are in the seed guide, uh, the results that you can find for each variety. And then we also have a lot of collaborative research among governments, academia, commodity groups and private industry. And this is all part of the value chain where if uh, somebody has a, you know, a bright idea in the 
innovation and research continuum. It trickles down to doing basic research, then applied. Then we have extension with uh, field days. And then hopefully the good ideas uh, are adopted on the farm. And maybe if we can learn some bad ideas too, uh, we can prevent those from hitting the farm as well. And uh, we also get input from uh, at all those levels of development, uh, you know, either from our board of directors, our commodity groups, private and public sectors, uh, the farmers, uh, and we also have influence from our provincial strategic initiatives. And um, as you can see, there's levels of uh, industry on the left there. Uh, we have the industry right at the top or the, the customer who needs this new idea. And then uh, as it trickles down through the universities and, and our provincial uh, initiatives and things like that, uh, we eventually get to adoption. So how do we select our projects at the DCs? Well, uh, we um, it comes from a, you know a, a variety of sources, and I had mentioned uh, often it's from farmers. Uh, they often have great ideas, observations that uh, need to be looked at. Uh, but uh, so many other ways it can come in from educational institutions, maybe agriculture, agri-food Canada, uh, commodity groups, etc. So uh, everybody has uh, you know different initiatives. Uh, some are similar, um, some are different, and those can pose uh, you know challenges in strategic planning. But uh, other than that, uh, we all seem to get along very well, and uh, we get our jobs done. So uh, we do select based on a sort of a um, scoring criteria for projects. And uh, uh, we weight heavily with some department priorities, which is like water use, climate change, greenhouse gas reduction, uh, the protein sector and regenerative egg. Uh, but then we also uh, you know, have other um, commitments as well uh, within that scoring process. So maybe I'll get to the real meat and potatoes here with uh, what's going on at Wado this year. Uh, with cereals, we have uh, <clears throat> lots of variety trials, including oats, wheat, and barley. And uh, this is in collaboration with uh, Solio Egg. Uh, they, they're an oat company in Quebec. General Mills, of course, they have oats. And uh, McVet is our seed guide varieties. And with barley, we have uh, commitments with Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, uh, looking at malt, food, and hollis uh, barley. And these are in their co-ops. So these are the varieties that are just barely coming out. They haven't hit the seed guide yet, but we're just testing their stability to see how they are. Uh, then we have the fall and spring wheat uh, variety trials with McVet and the fall rye. And those look fantastic right now with all this rain. Um, and uh, they look like they're relatively on time as well. <clears throat> then with Ducks Unlimited, we have a, a winter wheat fertility project where we're splitting nitrogen uh, a diff across different varieties. And this uh, project is across the diversification centers as well. And then one of my favorites of the year is this uh, winter crops project. That's the bottom picture. <clears throat> we seeded April 4th uh, these different winter crops, including winter oats, winter barley winter wheat and uh, we even threw spring wheat in there. We have some winter peas and uh, winter lentil. And uh, for the most part, uh, we've been able to get them all to head or flower, except one winter wheat variety, which seems to be kind of lagging behind. And so we don't think it vernalized properly, but uh, for an April 4th seeding, it's very, uh, very compelling project. <clears throat> Moving on to corn. Uh, we have the corn hybrid variety trials with uh, Manitoba Crop Alliance, and those will be in the McVet uh, seed guide. Uh, we have inbred corn from uh, Dr. Ada Kadib from uh, AAFC Ottawa, and these are like the uh, the potential parents uh, for the probable hybrids that might be earlier in maturing and higher yielding in the future. And then we have a uh, little corn hybrid corn demo with uh, Barker's Agri Center and Cantera seeds. For oil seeds, we have a uh, True Flex Canola herbicide demo with Ron Rabe at Bayer. Uh, Linseed Co-op 
Uh, this is the uh, new varieties of flax coming through uh, from Dr. Benjamin Terran from AAFC Saskatoon. Daryl Rex has his sunflowers here uh, at uh, actually Napinka is where we, we planted them. And they look just fantastic right now. We did notice a few Ligus bugs uh, hanging around, but uh, we'll just kind of monitor, monitor those guys for now. Uh, we have a Camelina variety trial with Dr. Christina Einick from AFC Saskatoon and um, yellow and brown and Junsia mustards uh, with Dr. Bai Fang Chang in uh, Agriculture Agri Food Canada, Saskatoon. For pulses, uh, we've got quite a bit actually. Uh, for just beans, we have uh, an inoculant trial with uh, the University of Manitoba headed by Kristen McMillan. And we've done this sort of project for a few years. And in the photo, you can see one of the really good inoculants in the middle there, that's really green. So this year we've expanded it to kidney beans as a new market and we have a couple of new inoculants to try. So we'll see how those go. Dry bean nitrogen and phosphorus fertility trials with Dr. Ramona Moore out of Brandon uh, with a AAFC. Uh, we have Gord Finley coming out uh, at field day to talk about that and, and we'll discuss uh, the effects of nitrogen and phos on beans. Then uh, we have a dry bean co-op with Dr. Anfu Hao uh, out of Morden and a narrow road bean trial with Dennis Lang for the McVet trials. For peas, we have quite a bit as well. Uh, we have the variety trials with uh, McVet. Uh, Peter Giesbrick with Pulse Genetics has uh, his own uh, lines of peas that he's testing here. Uh, Roquette has a conventional and organic trial that we're looking at for peas. And they have some new varieties from uh, Europe, I believe, that they're testing. Uh, and then uh, we'll also have uh, Dr. Jim House uh, and his uh, protein projects. So he'll be looking at some of those McVet uh, peas for protein. Uh, then Roquette also has a nitrogen and phosphorus response trial in pea. And I know this sounds funny with nitrogen being involved. But uh, we're just looking at the effects on nodulation. It's more of a demonstration of, you know, if you have high nitrate soils, what do you do? That sort of thing. Um, organic pea variety trial with Roquette. Uh, and this has uh, got a second variable with seeding rate. So we have some very high seeding rates in pea in the organic situation to see the effect uh, uh, it has on weeds. And uh, then we have, of course, I mentioned the um, winter peas and the winter lentils, and they look pretty good, actually. The peas look a little leafy for my liking, but uh, the lentils had already flowered and they're part of, probably potting up. And I suspect maybe they can get around the timing that Ascochyta comes, uh, usually to take out the lentil. Soybean. We have uh, quite a bit here, uh, the, kind of the normal though. We have the McVet, uh, you know, glyphosate tolerant variety trials and the first year glyphosate tolerant variety trial, and that'll be in the seed guide. Uh, then we have the conventional variety trial as well. And uh, that's with Dennis Lang. We have some diversified crops too. Uh, we do, uh, Work closely with Prairie Mountain Hops in Boisevain. Uh, that's Randy Tai who has the the hops, and we uh, will be going there very soon to go scouting bugs and uh, make sure that his fertility program is on on spot. Uh, our orchard is, which was established in 2011, is producing tons of berries right now. We have cherries, Haskap, and Saskatoons, and they'll be just around the corner here for maturity. Uh, quinoa, we have two trials. We have a variety trial and a seeding date trial. And this is with Percy Phillips uh, with Phylex. And uh, we picked up the hemp variety trial this year. Uh, so we'll be looking at uh, grain, fiber, and CBD, I believe, uh, with that. Uh, it's with the CHTA. Intercrops, uh, we have a few intercrops. Uh, one with uh, Roquette, and we're looking at pea barley, pea oats, and pea canola at different seeding rates. And this is, I think, the final year of that project. 
And then we have the annual forage trial, which includes two treatments, one a pea barley and one a pea oat treatment. Uh, it's always interesting to see those in the, in the um, feed quality side of it too. For livestock work that we're doing, I just mentioned the annual forage. And so there's, uh, you know, wheat or not wheat, triticale, uh, we have uh, uh, barley, oats, and then the intercrops uh, within that and, and a bunch of millets, including uh, sorghum and German millet. Um, looking at the corn and hairy vetch companion crop trial that we have, uh, this is a project we had last year during the drought and we have it again this year. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to compare a wet year versus a dry year in this situation. And uh, last year, my summer student used it as her thesis and had a very successful run with the project under the drought conditions. So I can't wait to see what it does this year. Then with uh, Dr. Yvonne Lawley at the University of Manitoba, we have a cover crop uh, project with corn. And so we have 60 inch row corn with cover crops in between. Uh, ranging from Italian ryegrass to hairy vetch. Uh, I think there's clover in there of some kind and um, I see, oh, radish, I believe is another treatment. So just wrapping up here uh, for the Wado side, I wanna highlight our tour uh, on July 20th. And it starts at about 9.30 in the morning for registration and runs till about 2.30. There's a free lunch, come on down. It's one mile north of town. And uh, I will try to put up the, uh, the link in the chat when I get a, a chance here for all the participants to, uh, to reference. So July 20th, 9.30 in the morning, one mile north of town. And if you need to contact me, uh, just type in my name, scott.chalmers at gov.mb.ca. And uh, I can pre-register you for that field day, or you can give me a call, 522-5415. So uh, maybe we can pass it over to another site here. Okay, yeah, uh, thanks, Scott. Well, I guess uh, we'll go to uh, Hader next and the uh, site at Carberry. Hey, thanks, Lionel. Uh, just trying to share my screen now. So far, we can see it in working mode, Hader. If you want to go to slideshow mode, please. Sure. Okay, can you confirm if you can see my screen? Looks great. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, so I am Hader Abbas. I'm working as Applied Research Specialist at Canada Manitoba Crop Diversification Center. Um, I manage CMCDC uh, for Applied Production Research uh, Trials at um, also in common with the uh, video that Scott Chalmers just described. Uh, taking this opportunity to highlight some research and extension capacity available at CMCDC, we have about 300 acres research area. Uh, the soil types are clay loam and sandy loam. Um, uh, we have irrigation application facility here. Uh, we have all kind of small plot research equipment that are used in small plot applied research. Uh, weather station availability here to um, to get a sense of what we got after the mother nature. A research site has also boardroom uh, and other extension uh, uh, extension capacity here just for uh, producers um, uh, meetings and all that. Uh, and we also develop uh, knowledge transfer videos to uh, our field days and other extension events to. Uh, to facilitate that knowledge transfer for, for those who could not attend the field day. Uh, just providing a high level uh, research plan for 2022. This will also provide a, an understanding that what you can expect to see on, on um, um, a CMCDC's field day that's scheduled on August 9th. Uh, for in the, under the cereals category, we have uh, winter wheat variety evaluation, uh, fall rye variety evaluation, then spring wheat, oats, and barley, and all this data would uh, directly go to Seed Manitoba Guide to, to, to become available for producers to make business informed decision. Uh, we also are uh, starting a new initiative this year. It's Malt Barley Variety Evaluation and uh, there's some, some other winter wheat fertility management projects. 
Uh, con is uh, quite a bit big portion here at CMCDC this year. Uh, uh, we are testing different kinds of uh, nursery and hybrids in birds uh, with um, uh, within Manitoba. Uh, some are with Manitoba crop lines. There are some with AAFC um, in Ottawa, and there are some in Mazex uh, with Mazex that's in Ontario. Uh, this collaboration gives us an opportunity to test different kinds of hybrids and inbreds that are being developed at uh, other centers or, or different provinces and we are bringing them to Man Manitoba to, to just check their efficiency that how will they do in Manitoba climatic conditions. Uh, under oil seeds category, uh, we have flax and sunflower uh, collaboration with uh, Manitoba Crop Alliance and then there are some pulses uh, projects as well as Scott identified with, with Ramona Moore and Gordon. This, these are uh, same projects uh, being tested here and in Malaita for uh, for testing their um, uh, efficiency in different climatic zones of Manitoba. Under special crops, quinoa is a big part this year. We are testing uh, quinoa seeding date, and uh, we are also testing some varieties that are uh, that that have shown promising results in previous years. Um, there are some other BMPs development for quinoa. It's a collaboration with Norquin Quinoa, located in Saskatchewan. Uh, then we also have some hemp uh, grain and fiber variety. We are also establishing and managing hops varieties here at CMCDC. Uh, forages, uh, under this categories, we have uh, annual forages tests that's uh, become available again for Manitoba producers for uh, at Seed Manitoba Guide for uh, for selecting best varieties to go ahead. Uh, there are some intercropping trials here that are also showing some promising results um, that uh, we have planned to present at uh, field day as well. Uh, TEF test, this is a new initiative uh, at all four centers this year um, to test how it works in, in Manitoba conditions because it's a, it's a warm season loving crop and uh, we have intermittently uh, warm and cold uh, uh, days this year. So it'll be interesting to see how it's going And Alpha Alpha forage trial, this is um, a continued trial from, from last uh, seven, eight years. Uh, potato is also a big part here at CMCDC. Uh, I would say uh, kind of a specialty. Um, there's a herbicide injury uh, uh, in potato production uh, demonstration that's scheduled on um, July 14. Actually, this is uh, other than field day. I will uh, talk about that a bit um, in in the extension uh, portion. We also developing a project called mustard biofumigation to control verticillium wilt. Um, that's also a a five-year project that's ending in um, 2024, uh, showing very promising results. Uh, testing uh, nitrogen dynamics within potato root zone. Uh, some cover crops initiative this year, uh, uh, controlling soil erosion through through different means and testing soil erosion that how how it can affect uh, potato yield. Uh, impact uh, of compaction on um, potato quality is also one of the um, uh, great projects going on here. Uh, application of irrigation and variable mode is also um, an important uh, scenario because um, uh, some part of field needs more irrigation uh, compared to others. So that makes uh, it more feasible to go ahead with variable rates to save some water to use water more efficiently. And there are some uh, decision support tools uh, being developed for potato irrigation scheduling here. Uh, this is my uh, field day uh, flyer for uh, August 9th. Um, uh, it provides a high level glimpse of uh, what you, you can expect. I just uh, cut off the portion that's uh, uh, at the bottom just to provide a bit more uh, inside of what, what you can expect on uh, August 9th here. So, uh, CMCDC is located at northeast corner of highway number one and highway number five. Um, many know about uh, where CMCDC is from. CMCDC, uh, there's another uh, site uh, that's feasible for potato production. Uh, it's a sandy loam soil uh, about two miles north of CMCDC. And then I will put some signs there for, for your convenience to, to, to go ahead to the actual field, but it's about in total about uh, three and a half or three miles from, from CMCDC site, so you don't have to travel more. Um, we start right at 10 a.m. Uh, with the topic to um, talk about uh, BMPs in potato applied research. 
So Newton research on uh, nitrogen and sulfur availability. Uh, this is a, uh, the previous research has indicated that row closure sulfur and nitrogen deficiency was a significant uh, contributing factor to processing uh, potato shield variability. Further research demonstrated that leaching in sandy soil was the primary uh, culprit there. So current research explores products and practices to decrease leaching to ultimately uh, provide uh, soil nutrient availability at row closure. So you are not losing any nitrogen to, uh, to leaching, uh, which improves the yield and tuber size profile, uh, plus the dollar value that's, uh, that's most important. And I usually call it as marketable yield. Uh, the same variability research highlighted verticillium wilt as a major contributor to yield losses in Manitoba. And we have been exploring uh, green manures with brown mustard since 2018 in both small plot and field scales to manage verticillium wilt um, and have updates on uh, improving the methods and uh, measuring uh, cost effectiveness in this field day. Lastly, under this, this topic, we wish to uh, unveil our latest cover crop research uh, to armor soil, build organic matter, uh, increase uh, nutrient cycling, increasing soil health. Uh, this particular portion includes covering uh, the shoulder seasons on the potato rotation with nurse crops, companion crops, and uh, some post-harvest cover crops mixtures as part of our uh, region egg uh, program. Uh, at 11.30, we, um, we plan to do hard stop uh, off to CMC, CMCDC back uh, on site for lunch and some networking as well. Um, at uh, 12.45, we will restart again. And uh, this time we will uh, highly focus on crop diversification program and uh, potato rotational options there. Um, farm risk management tools is one of the topic that's scheduled for the day. Uh, Manitoba Agriculture uh, has introduced interactive uh, farm software and uh, worksheets to put data to work for producers farm. And these resources can act as a starting point for farm budgets and can be adapted to your operation using farm, your farm uh, records. This will help uh, producers to make um, informed decision for your farm and family. Um, so this is this is a this is a very great topic uh, for 15 minutes of, and there will be five minutes buffer for um, question and answer. Darren Bond is invited to talk about this uh, uh, specific vibrant pro uh, topic. Uh, the other uh, topic that uh, I'm planning to discuss is high value cover crop and curve. Uh, the CL specialist for the province um, is anticipating to visit for, for this particular initiative. Uh, Manitoba is the heart of Canadian uh, grain industry with many uh, commodity organization and leading companies clustered around Winnipeg and um, other parts of Manitoba. Uh, the province is the third largest producer for spring wheat and barley in the country and Canada's uh, varieties registration and grain grading system enabled the production and export of clean, consistent, and high quality grains. So this would be the main uh, theme of um, uh, our uh, this specific topic. Uh, and thanks to Anne for for coming to talk about that. Uh, another project I want to highlight here is uh, uh, Macwet peas that we are growing for variety testing. And Dennis Lange is uh, is coming alongside Ahmed Farooq for, um, uh, for, for talking about this specific uh, project. Um, uh, so, so speaking about peas, Manitoba has an uh, economical and sustainable land base with uh, good transportation network and making it an ideal location to grow uh, the pea, industry, pea protein industry. And the demand for Manitoba ground peas is uh, forecasted to grow as pea um, processing capacity increases in the province. So we are uh, testing those varieties by growing peas that provides uh, the best yield uh, and best um, uh, best soil structure after harvesting peas, I would say. Uh, another project that uh, uh, I like the most is uh, integrated crop livestock system. Uh, Sean Quebec, um, uh, Ag Adaptation Specialist, is invited to talk about that. Um, so uh, the reason reason to include this particular topic in the uh, field day is to promote uh, crop and livestock integration. Um, if we see in Manitoba currently in, in the province, most producers separate livestock and 
pastures from cropping system uh, and relying on off-farm uh, purchases of certified feed for their animal herds or fertility for their crop fields. Uh, this can increase uh, production cost, especially with the price premier for grain, fuel prices, as well as uh, increasing um, greenhouse gas for transportation. And we target uh, to integrate uh, crops and livestock because it's a multifunction operation and could have multiple benefits and the potential to improve the profitability of these kinds of operations. Um, uh, researchers, uh, I would say, at all crop crop diversification centers, not only at CMCDC in collaboration with provincial forage and livestock specialists, are conducting research projects to evaluate the production, environmental, and economic benefits of growing cash crops on forage crops for grazing. Uh, and uh, there are some small grains and hay crops for livestock feed as well. Uh, so, so this is uh, pretty much a wrap up. Uh, by 2 p.m., we would be done. So from 10 to 2 window, uh, mostly. Uh, I will drop a link in the in the chat soon after uh, I'm done with the presentation. Uh, it's also available at mbdiversificationcenters.ca. Uh, please feel free to RSVP or uh, just stop by on the day of. Uh, we, will, we will have lots of things for you to have a look on. Um, in the beginning of my presentation, I also mentioned about uh, a herbicide injury de demo. So CMCDC is also uh, putting together um, a, a herbicide injury demo. Uh, that's uh, about the herbicide drift demonstration. So we are applying different rates of uh, non-potato-loving uh, herbicide, I would say. Uh, that in case if you have grains side by side with potatoes or other crops side by side that uh, uh, potatoes do not like that if we get a drift at uh, at lower rate, medium rate or higher rate, how it's gonna impact the uh, uh, potato uh, crop and eventually the potato yield and uh, quality. Uh, this is scheduled on July 14. It's about one and a half hour event with 30 minutes buffer of coffee registration and uh, buffer. We will wrap up at 12 um, on, on July 14. Uh, other than field days, I want to take this opportunity to highlight other extension events going on at uh, CMCDC. Annual field day is one of them. Uh, extension workshop, including uh, potato scouting school that I just man, uh, um, mentioned. We also host producers research update meeting uh, in fall uh, to share results in person about what we uh, observed uh, during the springtime or summertime for, for the project that you you saw on field day. Uh, if you have question about them, they would be answered in uh, at that time too. But the, but the yield and uh, quality uh, related question would be answered in those update meetings. Uh, we also have academic tours where uh, students can also participate to to know about the um, um, the opportunities available at CMCDC and also uh, how how Manitoba fields are growing um, uh, and what crops are. Uh, there. Uh, there are some virtual extension events in the best interest of time. I will go over quickly on uh, there are some industry events where we have uh, uh, presentation and participation. So um, uh, you can meet us at Act Days, Prairie Days, and Agronomist Conference uh, and Crop Connect Conference, Canadian Spud Congress. Uh, and there are some publications that CMCDC and other centers are um, uh, publishing every year. We have uh, uh, mbdiversificationcenters.ca website as well, where we have projects update and results um, um, very frequently. Crop Centers is the uh, the common web um, uh, social media channel for uh, for all DCs where um, updates are being shared, and we also have a YouTube channel where you can see all uh, kind of extension events uh, captured um, in form of video in the comfort of your car or or the truck. Uh, yeah, that's all from my side. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Uh, Thanks. Uh, so now we will uh, jump over to uh, James and uh, and uh, and his site at uh, at uh, Robin. Great. Uh, is my just checking to see if my webinar um, thing is is that dangling in front of the screen or do you just see my presentation? We can, we can see your screen, James, and we can hear you good. 
Okay, great. So I'll be jumping on uh, the bandwagon here to show uh, a bit about what's going on at PCDF. PCDF stands for Parkland Crop Diversification Foundation, which weighs in at, I think, 12 syllables. So it's quite easier, quite a bit easier just to say PCDF. Uh, we are located, uh, oh, just a here. there we go. Uh, this is the, the staff uh, for working with us in the summer. We've got uh, a couple of regular PCDF employees and I am working with the department. We are located in Roblin and the um, this image shows the kind of what I think of as our catchment area the inside the red circle there. So we do have a, because we're right on the border of Saskatchewan, we do have some influence and, and um, uh, representation from, from people who attend our field days, for example, from Saskatchewan, but we kind of catch this Northwest uh, ag region. Uh, in 2022, we are um, doing <clears throat> uh, 58 plots, uh, 58 trials, and that's just under 3,000 plots. So just a, an overview here of what we're, we're up to this year in terms of working with cereals. We also are working with um, barley, oats, wheat, and winter cereals. Uh, among those groups, we have uh, McVet, uh, McVet trials, as well as, as I mentioned, we kind of have some, some relationship with Saskatchewan. So we're working with, also with uh, the Saskatchewan Variety Performance Group, or SVPG which functions in a similar manner to McVet. Uh, with OATS, we're also working with, uh, in addition to McVet and SVPG, looking at uh, organic trials uh, with Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, and uh, also doing some, some growing with an organization called Organic Alberta. We have some uh, SPP, SPPG uh, trials for wheat. We did uh, in the past also work with McVet there, but those are currently being grown in Swan River. If you're interested to see the, the McVet entries for wheat uh, in the Northwest region. We work with a, with a co-op called Parkland Co-op and of interest in that co-op is that we also do wheat midge assessments, uh, damage, uh, collecting heads for damage of wheat midge. Uh, as well as another organic trial with Organic Alberta. Winter cereals, Scott mentioned that we are uh, also involved. Uh, he had mentioned the Ducks Unlimited trial, which is looking at nitrogen fertility, and uh, we're involved in that as well. Uh, and here I have listed a pea winter wheat intercrop, which unfortunately the arrow <laughs> points at the words drowned out uh, as uh, anybody who has been paying attention this spring in Manitoba knows uh, it has been a, a autumn moisture going on. So where we planted our winter wheat, uh, unfortunately just hung out underwater for quite a while in the spring and we didn't have a chance to plant the peas. But last year we did a demonstration of the same concept. And the idea really is that winter wheat sometimes has winter kill or has variable survival over the winter. And in the areas where potentially the the crop is extremely thin, uh, the option exists to plant peas. And on a demonstration basis only, and on one year of data only, we, we did see that uh, planting peas into those spots, the two crops mature at a very similar rate, and we could harvest them together in the, um, in the mid, you know, or early, early part of the fall, and, uh, and then separate the two. So that worked out pretty good. We, we hope to continue to try that out. So just for reference sake, in 2021, we had about 60% of the plots were um, cereals, and it's, it's a little bit less this year. Special crops at PCF include corn, hemp, and quinoa. We have also grown um, in the past all kinds of bizarre crops. Uh, I shouldn't say bizarre, but uh, very uncommon crops like fenugreek and uh, caraway and, and things like that. Coriander, we have tried, uh, but uh, this year we're looking at corn, uh, the, a nursery trial that was mentioned previously, and variety trials with Agriculture Agri-Food Canada, as well as the intercropping trial with uh, University of Manitoba, which is looking at wide row spacing and um, putting intercrops in there like uh, hairy vetch or Italian ryegrass. Our site is 
well known for its work uh, historically uh, with hemp. We have a, a much smaller amount of hemp grown here now than in the past, but we continue to, to be the organizers and spearhead the uh, national variety trials, which take place um, all across Canada with with hemp. So so we organize that, and we're and we're one of them, one of the participants as well. And we also grow quinoa uh, with fillets uh, based out of Port Laguerre. For pulses, we have a pretty big uh, array of pulses this year, including the McFet Tea Trials, uh, a year one and a year two agronomy trial with the University of Manitoba, which is looking at the impact um, on the pea crop of growing peas on either canola stubble or wheat stubble and tilled or non-tilled treatments for both of those, as well as uh, the response to uh, for, uh, phosphorus either placed with the seed or side banded. We also have uh, variety trials with SAS pulse growers. So that's another way in which we uh, interact with Saskatchewan. Uh, the Fabibean trials are also being grown both with Saskatchewan entities, uh, SAS pulse and crop development center out of University of Saskatchewan. And then at uh, 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 what we could call an in-house trial or a PCDF designed and led trial looking at blue lupin. And we're uh, hoping to take a, do a split split plot treatment where part of the plot is taken for grain and another for forage, just to, just out of curiosity, because it's a fairly, fairly unexplored uh, crop, at least in our area. Oil seed include flax and soybean. So we have a, uh, this year, McVet and Linseed Co-op at Crop Development Center are uh, sharing space within the same trial. And then we have, a uh, oh, that's actually a mistake. We did have a conventional soybean protein trial last year, but uh, should not be included in this slide here. Uh, we're not growing it this year. Uh, but we do have SAS Pulse uh, growers long and short soybean, uh, short, short season trials. Forages, we've been expanding into this uh, area quite a bit in the last couple of years, recognizing that in the Northwest region and the Parkland region, we have um, at least half of our producers are uh, livestock producers. And so we really endeavor to make ourselves as relevant to everybody in the area as possible. And that's uh, one of the easy wins there is to look at forages. So as, as has been mentioned, we're growing McVet forages, uh, which has been expanded this year to include a couple more uh, long season entries as well. Teff grass is uh, exciting to me because uh, although it's kind of a newer, uh, I think a very new uh, forage crop in, the, in Manitoba, um, it has a lot of promise, uh, both for producing extremely high protein, very palatable uh, grass, as in, you know, a very, a very soft grass that is very pleasant for the cow to eat, uh, but it also uh, seems to produce in pretty high volumes. So it's an annual, and uh, we never want to go to the bank with one year of data, but uh, what we saw last year was was quite promising. We're also looking at uh, intermediate wheatgrass, which is uh, being bred uh, by Dr. Katani at the University of Manitoba. And then in two more um, in-house trials, which uh, are also being grown at CMCDC, looking at intercropping of pea cereals and hemp cereals for silage. And this year, we also just done a demonstration of some very late seeded TEF, which was broadcast and heroin to the ground, because that seems to be a much easier way of seeding it. And if it works well, uh, then, then that would be great. And here we've got uh, finally a, a group of what we could call uh, integrated, and uh, that would include uh, intercropping of uh, pea winter wheat. Uh, we have Pascalia and wheat. The idea there is ideally to create a pollinator crop that is in the middle of this uh, wheat crop, which otherwise would have very low appeal to pollinators. Uh, looking at growing chicory with cereals as a way of establishing it for the following year. Uh, and, and then we have four trials, which are more or less the same trial, uh, except that the cash crop changes. So there's barley, canola, oat, and wheats that are uh, wheat that is being grown with cover crops, including various clovers, alfalfa, uh, yellow sweet clover. So both, we, both, we look at both the first year when we were taking the grain off uh, and quantifying the impact. 
impact on yield that the cover crop has. And then in year two, looking at the, the productive value of the cover crop itself, uh, if we were to take it for a forage. So in uh, just again, to give a sense of comparison, these kind of integrated uh, trials where we have uh, about 10% of our total plots. <clears throat> we are looking also at uh, uh, wheat and phacelia on a larger scale. Unfortunately, this year, uh, where we grew it in a producer's field, the phacelia was drifted on, uh, got some spray drift and um, <laughs> was knocked out pretty good. So it has now just become uh, looking at wheat niche instead of looking at phacelia. Uh, and, and so among other things, we're looking at these various crops on a larger scale, trying to see, for example, uh, how does TEF perform, not just in a small plot basis, but actually on larger uh, areas, for example, at MDFI, where they have seeded up to about eight acres. And uh, just a plug that there will be um, in the first week of August, I believe it's August 4th, there's going to be a, a workshop there looking at TEF, uh, where I will be one of the speakers. So if you're interested in learning a bit more about that uh, and hearing me uh, share some of our results from PCF, then um, go ahead and look up the, the events page at the MDFI website and you can uh, get a sense of when that will be. Uh, and we also have been doing some some fruit trials, some hops trials, and, uh, and of interest to us this year was a demonstration uh, where we seeded some fall rye and grazed sheep on it this spring. And uh, currently it is uh, the rye that was not grazed is, you know, is well into uh, well past flowering and is not developing. Yet. But the um, uh, um, uh, other stuff is starting to head out, so that's interesting. We do extension, and uh, last but not least, here is the field day flyer, which you can also see at our, our website. So uh, I welcome you to again I would echo what Hater said. Check out the videos on the. Diversification Central website. There's a growing library there with um, currently several, quite a few dozen videos uh, of, of interest. So I encourage you to check those out. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks, James. Um, uh, I think we'll move over now to uh, Nermal. And Lori, if you could give me the screen, or are those Nermal slides going to show up for us? Um, I know. Can you hear me? I can hear you all right. Yeah, and we can see your computer. So if you can get to the screen, your slideshow, that would be perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, and you can see the slides now? Yeah, just go to presenter mode. Looks good, Normal. Looks good. Okay. Okay, thank you guys. Um, I was facing some technical issues. Uh, thanks, Lori, for your patience. Um, uh, I'm in Winnipeg, so you would expect like I would be the best uh, in connection, but actually I was the worst today. So let's move on. So I'm the last uh, person uh, from the diversification team. We exist in the interlake. Uh, this is the artwork site you guys are seeing um, on your screens. So we say uh, crazy sustainable agriculture initiative. We manage two sites in interlake and Eastman. So in interlake, we do work at our work site and in the East Man region, we also do some trials in Bozier. Uh, this is my team for 2022. Uh, Brad Sigurdsson and Sean Kendrick, uh, they're the new technicians this year. They have a lot of experience in, the, in the farming. Actually, Sean returned from New Zealand, uh, so he also has some uh, crop livestock uh, background. So. Yeah, unfortunately, we have a good team this year. Uh, Jazeen and Kate, the returning uh, technicians and the student, and then James Wendell and myself. And Emily, she's the new summer student this year. So I'm going to just provide a, a overview of what we're doing this year um, in 2022 at both sites. Uh, before I start, so this year, this is what we did last year. So as I told you, we managed two sites. We had almost uh, uh, 1,800 parts last year in the two crop type. And then this is what we're doing this year. So we have a uh, zero project at both sites. So we do the threats uh, in, in spring cereals and in the winter cereals at both sites. And so far, um, 
the trials are looking great. Um, we have that's a little bit of a wait for the trial at our, our, our website. Uh, we're also doing uh, um, some assessment of the biostimulants in oats, and that is from the Canadian government. So this trial is at the urban site. So basically the humic acid and some other organic acid. So we have applied um, at the seeding and wanna see how they're different from the control in oats. Uh, we have one trial from FP Genetics um, on the rental evaluation in oats. And uh, we're doing serial peas into cropping at both sites. Uh, so this is an in-house project from PSA in which uh, we're testing different seeding rates uh, for, for oats and barley in combination with peas, uh, just to see how the different seeding rates are gonna affect the overall grain production um, at both the sites. And we also have a top crop grower competition. So basically this is, uh, we invited all the local uh, dealers from Nutrinac, Patterson or some other guys. So they are trying the best recipe how they would like to grow spring wheat. Uh, this is uh, from the state board. They wanted us to do this so that uh, people can see actually all those differences at the field. So hopefully this is gonna be uh, something that will catch uh, attention on the field day. So, this is just in the spring wheat, just to start with. This is gonna be something we'll do every year now. Uh, in the fall soup, we have the peas at the site. Uh, they are not the best right now because of the test of moisture, but uh, I think they will make it to the yield. Um, the conventional soybeans, we have at both the sites. Uh, similarly, the herbicide tolerant uh, trial, uh, in the soybeans, we have the both sites. Uh, late peas, actually this was originally planned as early peas, like how early we can see peas on the tiles, but we were not able to see anything in our book till May 24. So then we shifted it to late peas. And we just wanna see how the tiles are gonna um, affect the production. Uh, like this is the perfect year to test the tiles actually. And I can see the differences even in, in the establishment. Uh, so stay tuned for the results, like how the different fields, we have three, four varieties uh, at two different seeding uh, dates uh, grown on the tiles and as well as also on the non tile land. So this is something we start, uh, we want to see in the early, but yeah, we'll have some, some numbers from the late seeding, um, how the tiles are going to affect the production. Uh, we also do some uh, contract work with the, uh, for NutriNet and Syngenta in sort of bean varietal evaluation, and that's at the Bozier site. The trials are looking fantastic right now. Uh, soybean IPC. So this is uh, from uh, Kevin Barron um, out of South Invalid. So he has uh, IDC tolerant as well as IDC susceptible varieties. And uh, we just wanna see how the irrigation will affect uh, the IDC and the overall yield production in the soybean in those thick lines. So this is at our website. And we also have soybean peas into cropping from Christian Mechlo. This is the fourth year. Um, last year we were super dry, so we were not able to get good results from this crop. And this year is the opposite. Uh, we have some plots in this crop. They were underwater and but hopefully, I think we'll have some numbers from, from this round this year. In the oil seed, we had canola variety trials because they are gone now. They were on, in the low spot and uh, they didn't come up because of the crusting issue. Uh, linseed flats, uh, it's still there. It's looking, it's looking bad. Uh, yeah, it's not a great year for the canola. We had to reseed our tiles for canola, but the reseeding actually uh, it went really well. And now the canola is up, and hopefully it's going to be it's going to be a, uh, a good crop at the end of the year. In the corn, we planned a few projects, but we were only able to do silage corn. Uh, 
because of the types of rains and moisture, we were not able to get into the field even. So we have silent score. Um, some of the parts, they were underwater and uh, the plants that is not great, but most of the parts are okay. So I'm, I, I've talked to the rights. Uh, we'll keep it for the time being, uh, and then we'll do. Uh, we'll make the final decision most likely in the next two weeks. So yeah, this is a trial we have at the producer site, not on on the site. The short season grain corn trial from AFC Ottawa, we were not able to seed till June tenth, and then we decided not to seed it because it, it was super late in in wake, uh, especially some of those lines. Uh, they will be late in in maturing. The special crops or special projects I, I, I recall, uh, we have quinoa, uh, quinoa varietal trial, we have September varieties, um, uh, we have hemp variety trial, they're going really good. Uh, soil temperature measurements on the tiles. So this is uh, something we want to do last year, but we, want, we were not able to do in time. So this year, uh, basically what we're doing here, so we have tiles on the site uh, at different tile spacing. So we have plots with 15 feet spacing, 30 feet spacing, then 45 feet spacing. So we're measuring the temperature on the top, like six inches, like how the different spacing, they will make some differences in the soil temperature in the spring uh, when we seed the crops in comparison to the non town land. So we started doing these measurements uh, twice a day, every like every day, morning and afternoons, uh, for one month between May 15th to June 15th. So we have the numbers. So uh, hopefully, uh, I mean, we'll see the trends and the, the results will be out this year. So this is on heavy clay. Uh, theoretically, the tiles should warm up the soils faster than the non tile, but uh, we we need the numbers. Uh, to see that, and hopefully we'll have it. And then we have wheat facilia strip cropping. Uh, so this is on the field scale. So we have a strip. Uh, we have seeded different strips of facilia in a in a replicator manner, and then we just want to see how the facilia is going to affect uh, the mitch as well as the weed aphids and also their natural enemies. So this is a quite extended uh, uh, study. Um, my training is entomology, so I like this. This is my personal baby. So we'll see how facilia and, and we were we were um, fortunate, like we have facilia established around the wheat. Um, and I mean, it was really wet, but um, the facilia is there, so we'll have those numbers. And the next one is the for yeah the forage projects. Uh, Pistain was typically known for the forage. Uh, research work uh, till 2014, whatever, but then we were not doing much of the forage work uh, for the last few years, but now we're getting back into forages. So we have the annual forages uh, from the province. Uh, cereal legume and corn legume containing cropping, these are the in house projects. Um, this is the first year. Unfortunately, the cereal legume was underwater, and we have two reps. Uh, they're, they're doing okay, but the third rep is gone. But I think it is interesting to see some of those grasses, like they they survived in a in a in a waterlogged condition, like that was like for five days. So we'll have some information from that trial and the corn legume. This is looking excellent. So we have some legume species grown with the corn. Uh, we have the peas, the soybeans, pinto beans, persine, uh, pretty veg. And just to see how they affect the overall forage production as well as the quality. And we have Tef from Deer Fry, so this is looking good. Uh, Tef is a small seed. I was a little hesitant uh, because we had so many crusting issues on the site, but uh, I think we know how to grow the Tef, so it is up, and um, we'll, we'll have the results. In the time drainage, and you can see from this picture uh, on the left side, uh, we have not see that the uh, those little green spots there like neighbor's land so in the middle like here we have wheat and we have canola and we have soybeans on the tiles on different spacing and on the right side just besides the road we have a 
on child land. So wheat and soybeans, we see that in time, I think that was like late May, when whatever, that was the best for us. Like we started on May, June, uh, May 24th and we seeded tiles, I think May 27th. But the canola we had to reseed on June 20th, the last date. And that's on the left uh, side, the first uh, long strip. And uh, this is the picture I think I've taken probably mid June kind of. So you can see uh, the non tile land on the left side, that long strip from, from our neighbor. Uh, the water is all over, um, but the tiles are, are performing really good. And actually, I got a call from my, my student this morning. Like, the tiles were pumping water for the last two months, and today is the first day when we haven't seen any water coming out. So yeah, I think this, this will be the year when we'll see the difference uh, between the tiles and the non-tile land. And uh, yeah, this, is, this will be for three different crop types. We'll see for wheat, soybeans, and canola. Uh, this, is, this project is from UFM. This is the fourth year. We were not able to see any difference for the last two years. We were super dry, uh, 2020, 21, and 19. So we extended this project for this year and hopefully we'll see some uh, difference in this year. We also have uh, excessive moisture in soybean IDC and we planned like we'll put more water in one of the set, but so far we need not to. We, we are already excessive all over, uh, all, all, all around. So um, we'll see how we're gonna manage this drought moving forward. This is the picture. Uh, I have taken yesterday, like July 5th. So the wheat on the tiles on your left side, and then the wheat on the non-tile, that little um, island on your right side, just beside the road. So you can see that visually that how how much the difference is. Um, and the soybeans are in the middle, so they're still uh, a little struggling, but I think they will be better um, as we go forward. But we haven't got any rain for the last uh, six, seven days. Yeah, on the extension side, uh, we have a crop tour planned on July 26th. Actually, next slide will be the slide before we are going into the details. We also do a uh, soybean research tour, and actually Terry Bus takes the lead, so he calls uh, for that tour. Usually it happens in uh, early to mid-September when you can see the differences in the different uh, varieties. So hopefully we'll have this year. I, I'm going to talk to Terry. Um, so for the Pisse crop tour, so we have this on July 26th. Um, it's going to be from uh, 9.30 to 1 o'clock. We'll start with the restriction and some coffee and snacks. So we have some talks, uh, biostimulants, and the materials, so it's going to be Tim Dick. Um, he's going to just uh, present his experience with the biostimulants and different trail crops. Uh, we will also touch uh, on the top crop grower competition and uh, some of our own in house projects. And then after that, uh, Terry will, or maybe Dennis will talk on how we're going to grow soybeans at least in a bet here like this. So. Um, that's going to be the next talk, and then annual forages and the mixture. Uh, that's going to be Pam. And the last talk will be on the weed generator of agriculture. Uh, and actually, wrestling the why question why we should have that approach. Uh, uh, so that's going to be from Scott Bacon. Um, we had a speaker at our AGM in April, and uh, people like that. So this is just so that we can have that conversation again in a, in a bigger group. So Scott will talk on regenerative agriculture and then we'll have lunch after, afterwards. So yeah, please let me know if you're planning to come to us and actually that you can see the tiles this year. That's gonna be the number one thing. I haven't mentioned it here, but we'll also talk on the tiles. Like how tiles uh, has affected the salinity. Uh, you from, they did some work last year and how they're gonna affect uh, production this year. And uh, this is something the say board asked us to do in the next uh, five years. So we are allocating a dedicated spot to the regenerative ag agriculture research. It's going to be like five, six acres starting this fall and into, into the next five years. So if you guys have any, any research idea on regen ag, 
you just want to collaborate with us, please uh, contact me. Uh, we're talking with the different uh, partners uh, over the summer and the fall so that we can work with some of the projects starting next year. So yeah, if you have any idea on, on this aspect of the crops, please contact me. Yeah, that's everything from me, uh, Lionel and Laurie. Uh, thank you so much uh, for the time. Hey, thanks, Normal. Uh, and I'd like to thank uh, all the presenters today. Uh, as you can see, the diversification uh, um, centers are, are fairly busy and uh, have a lot going on. So uh, I think it'd be uh, uh, really good to attend uh, their field days. Uh, uh, they have some similarities, but they also have some new uh, uh, different research happening that is more, I guess, prone or, to their areas. So uh, thanks guys for, uh, for presenting today. And uh, I uh, hope you uh, have a, a good, good attendance at your field days. I think it's gonna be some really good information. I guess with that, uh, just a few slides to uh, end today. Um, uh, again, the wheat guide's available, and as we get into fungicide season, I think uh, you'll find some good information in there. Uh, the ag adaptation specialists, uh, there's our contact information, so uh, uh, definitely contact if you've got questions of what's happening in the field. Uh, our livestock people, uh, there you go for, uh, uh, we might have a uh, a little bit of a hectic haying season here with the moisture we've been getting. So if you're looking for advice of getting some of that hay up in good quality, definitely give these uh, these people a call. Our egg service centers, phone numbers. Um, you know, we're, uh, I guess a big thing now would be with some of the storms we're having is if you don't have hail insurance, definitely uh, look to these offices uh, for, for hail insurance uh, for uh, the rest of the growing season and our contact information, myself and Lori Forbes. I'd like to thank everybody for attending. Uh, thanks for the diversification centers and uh, see you next week, uh, July 13th on CropTalk.